Ali Hassan, Chief Medical and Healthcare Officer at Vitality. Thanks very much to the Frontiers Health team for having presented this event here. I'm very grateful to Roberto, Ellen and Luigi and the team for inviting me to join this great community, which manages to capture online the fantastic ambience and just an amazing selection of speakers and content from across the globe in digital health. I'm going to talk today about the new normal, how Vitality's insurer have responded to it, and other facts I think will hopefully be of interest to this audience. I'll just share my screen now. What does the new normal mean for us as health insurers? Firstly, it's about unpredictability in every walk of life in the pandemic, not just the healthcare services we fund, the economy that sustains us and other organizations, but little decisions about how you interact with your family, how your children go to school, how you go and see a doctor, other aspects that pervade in every part of your life. Also, we've seen that there are unmanageable levels of complexity. Traditionally, business planning often looks like projecting the near past onto the near future. Given the fact that there is so much uncertainty relating to this pandemic, it's made planning multiple scenarios and multiple different outcomes of how we start returning to normality very difficult, assuming that we ever return to normality. This brings us to the third point. There is an unnerving reality that the economy that we've built up over the past half century and longer, predicated around just in time, around optimization, um, and all with an underlying implication of stability, is really, really threatened by large shocks of these two. Every country that had some degree of affectation from the pandemic was not ready as well as it could be. And for us, this is going to loom in our minds for the rest of our lives. In terms of the short term of how it's manifesting itself as the new normal, we're seeing different behaviours from patients, clinicians, healthcare facilities and providers, and in digital health. Patients globally have been avoiding more care facilities, particularly patients who have higher risk, who might be older, I think minority groups and other areas, because there is naturally a concern about contracting an infection from a healthcare facility where there may be people with COVID and maybe staff with COVID. We're also seeing individuals taking more accountability for healthcare too, whereas traditionally there was a lot more, um, I think, reliance on doctors and particularly where there are services that are free at the point of need and expectation that those could be used um, quite freely. People are being a lot more judicious about their use of healthcare and potentially it's swung too far the other way with increasing reports of people potentially not accessing healthcare when needed. There's also, while we go through this pandemic, while we're in lockdown and while we're in very different working and living environments, an accumulation of the physical and mental challenges of being in lockdown and the uncertainty for the future. We've seen lots of reports on everything from the COVID-15 pounds that people put on in weight due to having less active lifestyles to the um, concerns and mental health problems that can come with fears about continuing work, about being placed out of work or on furlough, and about thinking about how the future will be. Doctors, like private hospitals, have seen a sharp reduction in non-COVID activity. This is because, in part, there is a concern, as mentioned before, of uh, the risk of infecting people or catching the infections, but also severe equipment shortages and um, an unsureness about the, um, the surge of COVID cases that might come and a need to preserve capacity. This is good, though. As they move to more of different areas, they are being clear with patients about the risk-benefit balances of different treatments whereas everyone with a breast lump might have had a biopsy in some areas before. Now, if they're low risk, you can have a discussion with the patient and have that open consideration about what the risk benefit balance may be. Also, um, there's been a real urgency about getting things done. And a lot of the bureaucratic barriers that you see in health systems have just melted away as people rush to collaborate and unite against this pandemic. The effect of people accessing healthcare less affects hospital facilities and other providers simultaneously. The waiting list for non-urgent care accumulate significantly and the supply chains are disrupted. What this means is that it's harder to get supplies for the types of surgery that might be needed. And that's not just masks and PPE, anesthetics are a shortage, swabs are in a shortage. And this causes challenges around 
starting to re, uh, restart healthcare when the time comes. There has been also in the UK a change in differentiation between the public and the private sectors and an unprecedented level of collaboration where the NHS signed an organisation with the private sector's trade deal to essentially cover the cost of all those facilities in return for having access to all their facilities and staff. There are also material sustainability challenges. These manifest themselves in the present where hospital occupancy is very low, but the ongoing operating costs don't change and also will continue to be an issue later on, where with enhanced cleaning regimes, increased infection control prevention, and a more judicious approach to many things, the operating costs of an operation are going to be higher, of outpatient care going to be higher. We're hearing from some hospitals that they expect with enhanced cleaning regimes that throughput of theatres may be down to as little as half of what it was previously. Finally, in terms of digital transformation, we've seen years of transformation in weeks, which we alluded to earlier. Video consultations have been a real success factor during this time and have been great to help patients understand how urgent their care might be if they need to see someone urgently. Triage kind of investigations or diagnostics they might need, reducing the number of touch points in facilities and also to continue follow-ups when they're currently under active care. There has been a gold rush for PPE, testing and therapeutics, and lots of this has been discussed in the news and also seen in the markets, including some of the reactions to announcements around vaccines, new therapeutics, and other treatments. So what have we at Vitality done to help our members navigate the panic? Firstly, I've talked to you a bit about our health strategy. Firstly, we want to make people move as early in the health and disease cycle as possible. Being healthier is better than having diseases, and treating early is better than treating later. The five pillars of our strategy across this are improving people's health and health education to reduce demise and demand for healthcare. The second one is facilitating great self-management where appropriate. The third one is supporting appropriate primary care management. The fourth one is working with high quality, high value secondary care providers. And the fifth one is optimizing the right amount of intervention, not under treating, not over treating. Within all of this, we focus on performance. Firstly, we've had proactive, general and segmented outreach to our members. We've been able to look at our member population and to identify the ones who've had care, who are waiting care, and who don't have, currently have care needs within different specialties and different population characteristics and target them with tailored communications to help them understand that while they might not feel comfortable or want to go into a hospital now, there are many other forms of health, well-being, and health care we can provide them. Similarly, a big part of this is helping keep members up to date with what's happening. There is a lot of news in the media about this. Sometimes it feels like the only thing that's out there. And we can help them understand where they can really get reliable, trusted information. And similarly, encourage people to stay there or to move to the next step when needed. We have massively expanded our primary care, which is now all available virtually. That's not just GP phone calls and teleconsultations, but also musculoskeletal consultations with physiotherapists and consultations and care with mental health practitioners. For secondary care, we also went from having virtually no clinicians who were providing video consultations to over a thousand available within weeks. And to the point earlier, seeing some really good discussions around how it can help in all types of specialties from orthopedics to infectious diseases to general medicine. Digital health has been absolutely crucial in maintaining the access to care for members during this time. Furthermore, we're helping support members to make choices about how and when to continue with care. Again, this is a big point about making sure they know their options and how they can interact with clinicians and how they can be supported. Secondly, as I suppose many of the audience will have seen, we have ratcheted up, not down our activity. We report daily on all kinds of trends we'd historically look at weekly or monthly. We've had a lot of commercial activity continuing during this, even though we're in the middle of the pandemic, because we want to respond and bring the best opportunities and the best types of care we can to our members. Our partners have helped us adapt in many ways during this pandemic too. The best amongst them have stayed in clear, open dialogue and have communicated to us all the changes they were making to develop their um, services to make them appropriate, such as Blue Crest, who provide wellness screenings for us. Many of them scrambled new technologies. Doctify, who provide our specialist partner, developed a video consultation platform. And um, Stephanie, the founder, talks about going in on the Monday morning and then having a contract signed in the afternoon because there was such urgency about getting this done when she realized what was happening. 
we're seeing some great new propositions. Um, our partners have helped us develop a vitality at home proposition, which takes our wellness program, which includes gym access, cinema tickets, um, amongst the ways to reduce barriers to, um, to exercising and incentivizing healthcare. And we've transformed that into having access to several apps at home, including Peloton, and to having uh, rewards at home with uh, Amazon Prime and other partners too. And finally, we as an industry have set up great working groups so that we can share information fluidly in a non-competitive manner and also talk about ways we can collaborate to work. We have also seen some issues with some providers as well. And um, if you are a supplier to insure any company, I wouldn't recommend you avoid and delay difficult conversations, particularly around sustainability. If you are having service issues early enough, let us know, because it's always terrible if we hear from our customers before we hear from you. We have had a um, tiny number of suppliers attempt to squeeze prices, and I suspect our relationship with them won't continue for very long. And finally, we've had organizations seize operations without warning. And um, the problem with this is the, the change in reputation that would have to the entrepreneurs going forward is something that will be remembered long after the company's folded. We're really keen to partner and connect with digital health companies who can help us support patient and healthcare needs. If we think about the core factors here, we know that uncertainty is certain. Getting people healthier is going to become harder as their activities are curtailed from what they were previously. Access to useful, clear, effective information and primary care telehealth in particular, but all telehealth being relevant, is completely necessary. Minimizing the amount of time you spend in hospital environments, care environments is key, to minimize infection risk. Speed and cost will remain crucial. Different countries and different ecosystems are in different phases about thinking about sustainability, but it's going to affect all of us and we will have to have those tricky decisions sooner or later. And finally, we recognize that implementation and working with larger companies won't be any easier. We are still larger organizations. We still don't have the nimbleness of a company with 25 or 50 people or with one single product. So what does this mean for us in terms of your proposition? What are the things that we're looking for? Staying accessible. So having a hassle-free flow through from us to our customers, minimizing the level of integration that we need to deploy, because this is something that typically takes a longer time proportionally to how big an organization is. And finally, making sure that your proportions are ready. Um, it's hard for us to see a pitch in um, with a software tool that isn't quite ready, that has visible errors or is in a different language. This isn't because we don't have trust that the solutions won't be deployed, but it increases the risk for us, particularly at this fractious, fragile time. So being ready at that pitch stage is really important. Secondly, staying responsive. Up-to-date propositions which embed the changes in the way that we live and work with the pandemic are important, particularly in terms of how they deal with information gaps about the future and having offerings that can ratchet up and down with threat levels. So say a telemedicine provider that can start delivering a network of clinics when the pandemic reduces with infection control, or similarly one that can, uh, for mental health, do the same and have hybrid options are typically much more um, compelling than single track ones that only work for a given stage. Staying effective is really important too. I think making sure that we can not only provide remote healthcare, but improve the outcomes of it is critical. And we are interested in hearing about self-management tools, which are home ready. And finally, safety is really important too. We still will continue to have evidence standards for what we roll out. We might not have all the evidence to give in stage, but we will need to make it clear to our members what evidence is there and what trade-offs there are. So great, usable, trustworthy decision-making tools for members and providers are important and tools which help provide admit later and discharge earlier, going to the point about minimizing time and care are more important. Thank you very much for listening to my talk today. It's uh, such a pleasure to provide the talk and to be part of the Frontiers community. And I wish you all the best in the pandemic and beyond, and please stay safe.